So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is David Ashiabo, and I'm the Financial Sector Strategy Officer at the African Development Bank. On behalf of the AFDB Making Finance Work for Africa and the IFC, I'd like to welcome you to this launch of our joint publication on gauging the appetite of domestic institutional investors for new asset classes in Africa. This webinar, um, we're launching, so we're launching a joint publication um, of the three institutions. Can I have the next slide, please? So first of all, to kick this off, I'm going to do a bit of um, housekeeping, go through some housekeeping. There'll be a brief introduction of making finance work for Africa, which I will also, which I will also provide. And then, and then we will go straight into um, our our main our main subjects. There'll be some opening remarks from the AFDB. We will go through the presentation of the findings, fo followed by a panel discussion. Um, there'll be we'll have obviously time for our audience to ask questions, have a brief Q and A with the panel, and then we will have some closing remarks and the way forward. So just before we kick off, in terms of housekeeping, um, our webinar today is scheduled for 90 minutes, including Q&A. We will try to keep to that time, but do forgive us. Apologies in advance if we do go slightly over because sometimes we get um, a lot of questions and we will, of course, try. We'd like, of course, to take as many of those questions as we can. To ensure a better quality experience for everyone, participants' microphones are disabled for the uh, duration of the webinar. If you do have a question, we would ask that you please use the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screens. We also have simultaneous translation in English and French. So if you click on the globe at the bottom of your screens, you should see, you should be able to choose your language um, and that will flow nicely for you. Um, as is standard practice with Making Finance Work for Africa events, the slides and recordings of this webinar will be circulated to all registered participants within 72 hours after the webinar, and they will also be available on mfw4a.org, so the Making Finance website. Please do send a message to the organizers if you encounter any, te any technical problems. You can do this um, through the chat function. And there will be a brief questionnaire um, at the end of your, which will appear on your browser at the end of this session. And we would really appreciate it if you could, if you could um, fill that out because it obviously helps us and the Making Finance Work for Africa team um, to make sure that they are giving you content that you, um, that is that is relevant to you. So just a brief presentation of Making Finance Work for Africa. Making Finance Work for Africa is a platform for harmonization and facilitation of financial sector development and knowledge sharing about financial sector development. It is hosted by the AFDB and it aims to contribute to the realizing the full potential of the African financial sector and therefore boosting economic development and reducing poverty in Africa. Making Finance, as I say, is hosted by the AFDB, currently funded by the AFDB. Afrexum Bank, Agence Française de Développement, the EIB, um, and the European Commission. Can I have the next slide, please? So today's webinar, um, as I say, we're launching this um, joint uh, publication of the AFDB, IFC, and Making Finance Work for Africa. I've already introduced myself, so I'll be your moderator for the, for the full session. I will be your moderator for the full session. We will have opening remarks by Mr. Ahmed Atout, who is the division manager, capital markets of the capital markets division from the African Development Bank. Then we will go into the presentation of findings by Jackie Irvin, who is a senior sector economist from the IFC and has actually um, done a lot of the, of the heavy lifting on this um, study. We will then have a panel discussion moderated by Guy Menon, 
who is the research and knowledge manager of Making Finance Work for Africa. Guy will introduce um, his panelists um, at the, at, at, just prior to the discussion, but we will have Dr. Shem Uma, who is the Chief Manager Research and Strategy at the Retirement Benefit, Retirement Benefits Authority of Kenya, and Marco Andrea Ma Nalina, I hope I got that right, who is the Head of Support Advisory and Assistance Unit for the Social, Secu Social Security Institutions at Cypress, Cypress being the pensions regulator for the Francophone uh, West Africa zone. And then we will have um, closing remarks from Dr. Issa Fai, who is the director of the Sector Economics and Development Impact Department at the IFC. So at this point, I'm going to just give um, a couple of brief, um, just a brief introduction to the study. And then I'll hand it to Ahmed Atout uh, for, his, for his opening remarks. And then we will come to Jackie to take us through the detail of the, of the presentation. Can I have the next slide, please? So this study, um, this study is intended to do two main things. First of all, we are trying to help um, capital market stakeholders, so African capital market stakeholders and DFIs, identify potential market interventions to develop new asset classes and provide new ways to mobilize finance for development. I think we are all familiar with um, the numbers around Africa's uh, uh, financing needs, around the huge sums of money needed to meet the STGs and how really there's an urgent need to mobilize uh, more private or yeah more private sector resources to support um, investment in, in the continent. So we are trying to support that through this study. A second, second objective is to help policymakers and regulators identify reforms that would further develop local institutional investors as long-term asset managers while safeguarding their fiduciary role and by implication further develop local capital markets. So in essence, what we are saying is, you know, we need to, we all agree that we need to develop Africa's local capital markets. And the only way you can do that is by having a strong and solid base of domestic institutional investors. So what we are trying to do here, can I have the, the next slide, please? Is, is really to understand what drives um, what, 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 what drives their, um, their, their, their investment decisions and asset and asset allocation strategies with a particular focus on alternative assets. Now alternative assets as we know fall outside you know the traditional um, asset classes such as listed equities, uh, plain vanilla bonds and short-term debt securities. Um, so we came up with a definition of alternative assets for this study, and we really focused on the list that you see on your screens. So um, funds and other investment vehicles that are specifically focused on infrastructure, affordable housing, green and sustainable finance, private equity and venture capital, which is not really a new asset class, but it's, it's one in which, um, as you will hear when Jackie does her uh, presentation of the findings, it's one in which there has been, there has been very limited, um, there has been very limited um, investment by, by uh, domestic institutional investors. We also looked at real, real, real estate investment trusts and asset-backed securities, exchange-traded funds, and other related um, products and uh, derivatives. I think what I'm going to do, if it's, if it's all right, is I'm going to stop here, having given that background to the study. Uh, I'll hand it over to Ahmed Atout to give us his opening remarks, and then we'll come back to Jackie to talk about the methodology and the findings. So thank you very much. Over to you, Ahmed. 
No, thank you, uh, David. Uh, dear participants uh, from all over the world and colleagues from the International Finance Corporation, making finance work for Africa and the African Development Bank. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the launch of our joint IFC, Making Finance Work for Africa, and the AFDB publication on gauging the appetite of African institutional investors for new asset classes. As we may all agree, that is um, almost a fact that long-term local currency financing is key to economic development. We have seen in different markets uh, than when, uh, that when the financial sector mobilizes domestic resources and allocates them efficiently, everyone benefits. Individuals have several options for savings and investments, and the private sector and governments can fund their investment uh, needs. In particular, mobilizing long-term funding for infrastructure that matches the currency of its revenue streams, which in most cases are local currency dominated. This view applies to other productive areas, such as manufacturing, industries, and affordable housing. We also know that economies that rely mainly on local currency financing for both sovereign and private sector transactions, such as Japan, USA, and the UK, are far better in economic development and are more resilient to global shocks, such as we have witnessed with the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis in Ukraine. It is therefore that against the backdrop of recent economic headwinds, declining official development assistance and constrained public budgets, African countries need to urgently identify new sources of funding to meet the development challenges. While preliminary indications are that domestic investors have remained active in African public markets since the pandemic began, less is known about their long-term investment strategy. It is clear, however, that Africa's institutional investors have a key role to play in the post-COVID recovery and beyond. However, while much work has been done on improving the investment climate in Africa for institutional investors, there is still little understanding of the appetite of domestic invest investors for new asset classes, including infrastructure and private equity, among others. We at the African Development Bank believe that building a solid base of, a, of diversified domestic institutional investors is critical to meeting Africa's financing needs. That is why we are proud to have partnered with the Making Finance Work for Africa and the International Finance Corporation on this study to help identify potential areas for market interventions, to help foster development of new asset classes and provide new ways to mobilize private finance for development. Our study focuses on seven sub-Saharan African markets, namely Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, South Africa, and the West African Economic and Monetary Union, the WAM region. However, we believe that lessons and findings can be applied across our continent and beyond. Our research highlights the importance of transparent and strong regulatory frameworks and collaboration between stakeholders and regulators in the creation of investment structures adapted to risk appetite and capacities of local institutional investors. We also highlight opportunities for DFIs to support local investors through capacity building, risk sharing, or mitigation and co-financing. At the AFDB, we believe again that domestic investors have a critical role to play in meeting our continent's financing needs. Our Capital Markets Development Trust Fund, uh, which is well known as the CMDTF, established with the support of the governments of the Luxembourg and Netherlands, supports the development of efficient capital markets through regulatory reforms, assistance for institutional investors, and the development of new products and instruments. We have also been very much engaged with different capital market stakeholders all over Africa to work, develop, work on developing a robust, integrated, and vibrant local capital markets in many of our regional member countries. We are, and we will keep working tirelessly towards that end using the AFDB funded and unfunded products and in collaboration with our development partners. I would like to reiterate my appreciation to the many people who made this publication possible through their insights, knowledge, and support. My gratitude goes to the pension fund managers and the asset managers, local institutional investors, the African pension funds supervisors, regulators, colleagues from the African Development Bank, and contributors from the Making Finance Work for Africa partnership, the World Bank, and of course, the IFC. I look forward to working with you 
to implement the findings of this report to unlock the increased investment that Africa needs to meet its development objectives. Thank you so much. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, before I hand over to before I hand over to 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 Jackie, um, we've had a comment in the chat reminding us that um, Cyprus's mandate actually goes beyond West Africa, which is which is correct. I think um, I refer to it as West Africa because in this context we covered um, the West African part of of Cyprus's portfolio. We didn't look at um, Central Africa, so um, that was why. So with that, let me now hand it over to Jackie, who is going to take us through um, the methodology and the key findings. Thank you. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so um, to begin with, uh, I'll be presenting our main overarching findings in two parts. This first part focused on findings derived from our analysis of the cross-country data-driven investment trends, mentioning up front, of course, that the report itself goes more deeply into the country market findings by asset class. Uh, slide 11, please. So just to start, some brief context here on the uh, on the slide and what you are looking at, uh, several dynamics, including increasing populations with growing middle classes and market reforms have led to expanding pension systems across the region over the past decade and a half. Although one or a few large state-owned schemes continue to dominate in several countries, pension reforms generally have allowed a larger role for privately managed fund administrators. The shift from defined benefit to defined contribution has been gaining momentum over this period, providing an overall competitive spur to fund management practices. Uh, the chart at left plots the strong growth of total pension industry assets overall over the past decade and a half, with total assets for South Africa's pension industry estimated at just over 240 billion US dollar equivalent at end 2020, up from just over 80 billion at end 2006. We have not included data for South Africa in the same chart as the other focus markets, as given the differential. What also isn't graphed at left is that total assets declined slightly in US dollar terms in 2020 for pension fund sectors in Nigeria and Namibia. The chart at right shows the increase in total assets for these six markets in recent years, which continue to grow over 2020 in local currency terms. And AUM grew more by more than one third in South Africa, although assets in local currency grew at a slower rate in Botswana, Kenya, and Namibia than in 2019. Next slide, please. Continued growth of pension system assets has helped stimulate new demand and interest in these markets and introduction of newer kinds of structures and asset classes in recent years, policymakers and pension industry supervisors across our focus markets have begun earmarking, raising the visibility of and encouraging more investment in certain asset categories, such as infrastructure and providing more flexible and clearer investment guidelines. In, in the case of these African markets, pension fund investment in, in alternative assets still accounts for a very small share of assets as the slide shows, <clears throat> allocation to local alternative assets ranged from 0 to 2.7% of AUM for the five focus markets that we have graphed here reporting end 2020 asset allocation breakdown. One probable reason the data show such a small share is that disaggregated reporting of multiple alternative asset class categories remains limited so far uh, to Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. Disaggregated reporting has increased across the focus markets over the past several years, however, with the number of alternative asset class categories for data reporting purposes, increasing from a total of five to 11 over the five years to 2020. Next slide, please. And it, this investment has remained well below national regulatory ceilings, which is the main message of this chart, which indicates these thresholds are not a barrier, not a significant barrier 
at all to investing in local alternative assets. National ceilings are the darker colored bars for the corresponding alternative assets plotted in the in orange for uh, PEVC, private equity venture capital, blue for real, real estate investment trusts, and green for a broad bucket alternative asset category in Ghana's market, defined by the national, national regulator there as including REITs, PE, and external cross-border investment. Pension funds' relatively limited diversification into these assets so far could be due to lack of capacity or familiarity with evaluating associated risk with newer structures. Limited local products of longer tenors, which would be in line with the longer term liability structures of pension funds remains a particular constraint and investment in and availability of products are affected by particular national macroeconomic and financial system context. It could also be that the reported data are not, not indicative of total investment by alternative asset class in some markets, as mentioned about a minute ago. Next slide, please. For the second part of our presentation, I'll give a quick overview of what our study found pension fund managers are seeking, broadly speaking now, of course, in terms of product. Then I will make a few points on findings by alternative asset class grouping, and then conclude with the report's recommendations. Uh, again, of course, the report goes more deeply into these findings by focus market as well. Our study found that it's not uncommon, including in the largest markets, for asset managers to approach asset owners with ready-made products that may not suit the particular investment needs and interests of pension funds. Pension fund managers across the focus markets emphasize the importance of developing more structures that would appeal and be well-suited to interests of the investors as well as the issuers. Proactive early engagement by local investment bankers, project promoters and regulators, pension funds and other market stakeholders would also better ensure that new structures would be of more interest, more clearly understood and relevant to pension fund investment objectives, according to the pension market stakeholders that we, we, we consulted. In markets where pension funds proactively engage with local investment bankers at an early stage of product development, the products are likely to be more relevant to investor needs and of more interest. Appropriate sequencing of market regulatory policy reforms is also important so as to strike the right balance in safeguarding pension funds fiduciary role while enabling them to maximize returns on investment as is strengthening investors capacity to evaluate and manage associated risk. Next slide, please. Um, so here, uh, we have um, sorry, learning is a bit different than what I had expected. Uh, market players in in Ghana, Ghana, Kenya, and and Nigeria, uh, in in South, South Africa, indicated that overall they favor energy and private market infrastructure assets over transport due to the relatively easier deal assessment better understanding of the transaction economics, more limited public sector role. However, the direct earmarking of proceeds for road construction as a tangible outcome, uh, and, and that's key, in, in recent sovereign issued Sukuk issues in Nigeria has raised the attractiveness of these particular issues to investors. As pointed out by a market player in Kenya, deal assessment is facilitated by energy sector transactions, typically having a more direct financial link with the customer paying an energy bill to the local utility, which then has agreements with generators. In Nigeria, a few market players indicated that they prefer the power sector over transport because the largely privatized power sector would generally be better suited to private investment. Notably, however, the direct year marking of proceeds for road construction, as, as, as in that bullet, is, is what in, in recent sovereign issues, Sukuk issues, has raised the attractiveness of these particular issues. Next slide, please. So actual structures for financing affordable housing generally are either scarce or have not been designed to appeal to investors in most of the study-focused countries. Um, 
liquidity is an issue for potential investment opportunities in, in affordable housing, as, as noted um, by pension funds in South Africa. A structure that would allow access to a portion of capital when needed would, would make this, this asset class more desirable. Um, investors across focus markets, however, have identified niche underserved property segments linked to affordable housing <clears throat> as of particular interest, affordable tertiary. Student housing in Kenya, land located close to mines where affordable housing is scarce in Botswana, social housing in Dakar suburbs, affordable housing designated for the National Police Force in Cote d'Ivoire, rural township shopping centers in South Africa. The, these are some of the examples of these sorts of niche sub-asset classes that were pointed out to us based on, 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 on our consultations with the uh, national uh, pension fund market stakeholders. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, attractive green asset classes, especially bonds are still new, if available at all. Green and social bonds and related assets comprise an important new asset class, and the, these would benefit from more education and awareness raising around the risk reward trade-off in the green and sustainability space. Um, in, in Ghana, for example, although at least one asset manager will be willing to take somewhat lower returns in exchange for greener, more sustainable outcomes, the asset manager was not sure that, that their clients, trustees, would be willing to accept this at least at the early stage of development for green and sustainable structures in Ghana. So again, more, more engagement awareness raising with trustees in particular and society more broadly would be needed first as emphasized to us in the study participants. Market players anticipate that interest in green bonds may grow, develop with further clarity on taxonomies, reporting procedure standards, the niche sub-asset classes themselves and as pension funds and, and asset managers, other local investors themselves grow and develop. Most of the longer term asset managers across our focus markets, markets emphasize that the starting point for uh, thematic assets, green assets, must be the potential to generate adequate returns and reflect fair pricing. At least a few asset managers in Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria indicated, however, they would be willing to trade off some returns for sustainability or at least waste, weight them equally in importance. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So um, for other alternative asset classes, such as ABS and exchange traded funds ETFs, appropriate local product remains very limited in practice if available at all including in South Africa's relatively well-developed financial market. There was broad agreement across the focus markets that prerequisites for operating these asset class markets with pension fund participation include specific appropriately designed regulatory frameworks to manage the risk, ensuring transparency and, and valuation clarity of structures. In particular, this is important for ABS. Pension market stakeholders emphasized to us that developing ABS structures could be a welcome means of boosting limited supply of local product, but importantly, as long as investors can be confident that the underlying assets are of adequate quality. In the case of ETFs, some of the asset managers in the more developed focus country capital markets have sought out automatic diversification for some portion of their portfolios either through ETFs, similar instruments, or indirectly working with an internal manager or mechanism for tracking the equity market there. Uh, the, these market participants have tended to prefer instruments in overseas markets, however, where these products confer more liquidity. A few asset managers pointed out to us that active portfolio management through a fund manager is better suited in, in some instances than these instruments for a longer term investment strategy um, but in the short ter shorter term, um, passive investment in instruments such as ETFs may make sense. For a portion of the more liquid part of portfolios they manage that may be needed to adapt in the short term as pension fund members retire. Market players in the focus markets with less developed local capital markets have tended to await suitable ETF products with lower fees to come onto their local markets. 
Next slide, please. So on to the recommendations. Uh, I, I, again, um, th this this will be the, uh, an emphasis on the on the cross market recommendations, but we encourage you to go into the report and 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 look at at at, at the market specific recommendations. We should mention that while while the study drew on African markets, pension industry, asset allocation data, and structured discussions with local institutional investors, their asset managers, and national supervisors, this study's recommendations also are relevant to these stakeholder groupings in other local capital markets in other regions at similar levels of development. So to wrap up, I'll just touch on some of the main recommendations coming out of the study grouped by broad category of stakeholders and development partners. Next slide, please. So for national policymakers, regulators, and local pension industries, the, the, net, the local capital market stakeholders, the local pension industry stakeholders, ensuring a regulatory market context conducive to allowing encouraging pension fund and other stakeholders to take the initiative engaging with regulated regulators as early as possible, and this was emphasized to us, in devising the kinds of innovative products that would be better aligned with regulations and, and also of interest to the investors, where project promoters are active and present in enabling clear understanding of newer asset classes across the spectrum of different market players from early stages of consideration. It increases the likelihood that the pension funds investing, the actual trustees, uh, we'll, we'll take these up, obviously assuming the contextual market factors are conducive. Providing regulatory clarity where needed more uh, education and awareness raising around the risk reward trade-off, especially in the, in the green and sustainability space was emphasized to us by market stakeholders is very important as far as thematics are concerned. Including pension funds in the forums that are discussing evolving taxonomies at the earliest stage again, which could help provide guidance toward developing these in a way that would result in products trustees actually want to see and participate in is very important. And finally, improving data collection and dissemination, harking back to the earlier slides, so as to better gauge and understand the relative market gaps in available longer term finance and thereby help inform policy making. Nigeria is really leading on this among the focus countries. More disaggregated reporting in regulators periodically release public documents and asset allocation could help make clearer whether and to what degree pension funds are taking up asset classes uh, over the time series that better match their longer term liability profiles. Next slide, please. Uh, I think we had one more on, on, on the, thank you. <laughs> uh, the larger, more experienced local asset managers, um, our main recommendation here is providing hands-on guidance for smaller funds on due diligence for newer asset classes and sharing of their own asset management experiences, importantly with, with the smaller market players. For market players and DFIs, providing more transaction support, including reviewing uh, actual live opportunities from the early stages that could enable longer term asset managers to better understand the opportunities and the risks associated with newer structures. The, we, we heard from market stakeholders that the presence of DFIs around the table to help with risk evalu evaluation could potentially provide some comfort. Of course, this is already going on to some extent, but according to a recent survey, of Nigerian pension fund administrators conducted by AVCA and PENOP. Um, and, and, and I hope um, Aguche is, is there in the audience to take this up in more depth. Just over two thirds of participate, participants indicated that participation of a DFI in, in a private equity transaction would be an important factor in evaluating opportunities in this asset class. DFI type initiatives with guarantees in PE engagements could help improve the risk profile in the eyes of trustees and other stakeholders, according to the market stakeholders we conferred with in the focus markets. So taking forward potential opportunities for DFI investors to work with pension industry, other market players, with the aim of devising vehicles that bring together co-investors to pool and channel the capital of multiple investors 
particularly smaller investors toward meeting longer term development finance needs was an important recommendation that we heard uh, from the national market stakeholders. This may help address capacity constraints, mitigate some of the risk associated with individual investor in individual investors conducting requisite due diligence. Smaller pension funds in particular said they benefit from more guidance on due diligence, sharing of experiences of other asset managers with PE, uh, larger pension funds on newer asset classes. Participating with DFIs and other co-investors could enable smaller pension funds to take ticket sizes more appropriate for their size, especially in the energy, in the energy sector. Thank you. And now I, I will turn over to Guy for our panel discussion. Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, what I suggest we do is uh, I will introduce first our um, panel, and then uh, we'll start with a 20 minutes discussion uh, before Dave, you and uh, David could join. Uh, the discussion. Uh, let me start by introducing our uh, panelists. We have today Mr. Adriana Lina, who is the head of the support, advice, and assistance unit for social security institutions at the Cypress, based in Lomé, uh, where he has worked for, since uh, 2018. Prior to joining Cypress, he was a senior manager of a social security institution for close to 15 years. Mr. Uh, Andrea Manalina, can you turn on your uh, camera? With us today, we also have uh, Dr. Shem. Dr. Shem uh, Uma has been uh, chief manager and head of research and strategy department of the Retirement Benefits Authority in Kenya since April 2014. He was for six years the manager and head of financial access and inclusion section of the uh, financial inclusion and stability division um, of the Central Bank of Kenya. He also worked as a policy analyst at the Kenyan Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis in the economics, in the macroeconomics division. Dr. Shem has also been a lecturer in economics and a researcher fellow in several universities in uh, Kenya. Welcome, Dr. Shem. Can you turn on your camera, please, Dr. Shem? Thank you. Thank you. While we, um, when, when we uh, start the discussion, please uh, feel free to, to send your uh, questions in the Q&A box. This is a message to the audience. Uh, in, in, I think in 20 minutes, we'll share them with, uh, with our speakers for answers. First thing to, to ask uh, our panel is uh, their comments, feedback on the report findings and recommendations, starting with uh, Dr. Shem. Thank you very much, uh, Alden. And let me start by thanking uh, ADB and the Making Finance Work for Africa for inviting us to the launch of this particular uh, research work. We are delighted to participate in discussing some of the findings that have come forth, which will largely, largely resonate with us. Let me just start from where it started actually that uh, in the past decade, decade and a half, the assets under management have been increasing across the continent. In fact, if we look at some of the charts, charts shared by Jacqueline, they have nearly all of them more than doubled over that particular period, nearly tripled, and that has been a good, good for the continent because uh, they provide alternative uh, finances for driving the investments and development in these particular countries. That growth indeed, as has been observed in the paper, has attracted a lot of attention, both from the, uh, from, uh, the public sector and the private sector. It has elicited a lot of attraction to investors, and, and that has been a good thing. In the pension sector, in terms of regulation, I think we have been uh, 
I would say in quotes, innovative in the way we've been regulating uh, resources of the pension sector. These are long, uh, long-term institutional investors. And I think she also observed very well that uh, across the continent, there are various uh, investment asset classes into which pension funds are allowed to invest. In Kenya, for example, we have provided for 15 different asset classes. But if you look at the history of pension funds investment, generally across the continent, and in Kenya in particular, investments in alternative assets have been a recent uh, occurrence, a recent development, and most of the alternative investment asset classes at the paper is considering private equity and venture capital, REITs, exchange traded funds, et cetera, have really come in largely in the last five years, or Kenya largely in the last three years, and so we find a lot, very little of pension funds investments going into them. And I think the finding then has shown that the proportion of what goes there is really almost negligible. But I think for, for that case, I think if you look at the figures, although they are very, very tiny figures, we see attraction being gained in terms of uh, pension funds wanting to invest in them. The major challenge for pension funds investors then in this new alternative uh, investment asset classes has really been the challenge of uh, familiarity and the challenge of uh, having the knowledge as to how they work. And so I like the conclusion by which the authors have arrived at that we need more education, more training, more awareness creation, particularly for boards of trustees that have the mandate to invest these particular funds, of course, through the service providers, fund managers, so that they are able to know exactly what they expect when they invest in these particular asset classes. And that, that is a positive thing. What I again agree with the paper brings out very clearly is that I think there's a case for, for co-investing with the, with the development partners in this particular space so that there are various things that they gain from that. They gain comfort, of course, that the risks have been properly evaluated. They also have a sense of, uh, of benefiting from the expertise that this particular co-investor has come up with. And these are issues that uh, we really need to encourage for local investors. The thing that has not come out very well from the study, I think, and maybe Jackson can look at it is, is in terms of uh, the individual pension funds in the continent tend to be very small. For example, in Kenya, most of the pension funds, and we have a total of uh, just about a thousand different ones, the majority of them are very tiny. And so they can only afford to invest in very small ticket sized projects. And I think uh, that co-investment also brings them the ticket sizes that they would really want to invest in. In Kenya, for example, we have had a development that uh, in the recent past, the last two or three years, that these pension schemes have formed a consortium so that they are able to invest in these large uh, ticket-sized uh, projects. And that is something which is uh, good for us and is something that us as the regulator are encouraging and more and more schemes are joining that, particularly to invest in affordable housing and infrastructure development. Thank you very much. Let me stop there for now. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Um, I'd like also to welcome here uh, Mr. Obuche uh, before I ask the, uh, the same question to uh, Mr. Andrea Manalina. Uh, allow me to introduce very briefly uh, Mr. Obuche, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Pension Fund Operators. Association of Nigeria, the PENOP. Um, before his appointment, Mr. Wuche was uh, Nigeria's regional director of, for our crowd. Um, and uh, he was recently nominated to serve as a board member of the Nigerian National Advisory Board for Impact Investment. Welcome, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Wuche, and I'm going to uh, turn now to uh, Mr. Andrea Manalina for his comment on, uh, on the report, and then I will ask the same question also to Mr. Obushe. Uh, 
Merci, équipe, de m'avoir donné la parole. Euh, je tenais euh, de prime abord euh, remercier l'équipe de MFW4A d'avoir euh, intégré la CIPRES dans cette euh, rencontre. Le, point sur, le sujet sur la diversification des placements, c'est euh, un sujet qui, retire, qui retient vraiment l'attention de la CIPRES du fait que les organismes euh, membres de la CIPRES que nous régulons au sein de la CIPRES euh, n'ont pas vocation à investir. Euh, les systèmes de sécurité sociale euh, adoptés par euh, tous, si je peux le dire, tous les organismes membres de la CIPRES ne reflètent pas euh, sur le, le système euh, des fonds de pension euh, de nature anglophone, mais beaucoup plus donc, agissent sur l'aspect euh, prestation définie. Donc, les caisses de sécurité sociale, ils ont beaucoup plus vocation à servir des prestations, mais du fait de la maturité des régimes de retraite qu'ils gèrent actuellement, ils arrivent à, à constituer, à débloquer un certain, une certaine somme de réserves. Actuellement, les données en notre disposition nous démontrent que depuis les cinq dernières années, les réserves des organismes de sécurité sociale en charge des, 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 des retraites dans les États membres de la CIPRES, se commente en moyenne de 15 par an. Pourtant, ce qu'on constate, c'est que les marchés financiers dans les États ne sont pas suffisamment développés pour absorber ces capitaux. Ces dents. Et deuxièmement, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, euh, ils n'ont pas vocation à gérer des placements financiers, à gérer des investissements. Ils sont beaucoup plus axés sur l'aspect service des prestations. Donc, il fallait chercher un autre moyen pour les accompagner et les cadrer dans la participation à la vie économique de, de, des États. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons choisi un axe stratégique vraiment important concernant le, la diversification, c'est que permettre cette diversification des portefeuilles des organismes de sécurité sociale tout en limitant les risques liés au placement, mais tout en contribuant également en contribuant au progrès, au développement économique et social de chaque État. Donc, de, nous sommes vraiment ravis de, de cette étude. Et comme je l'ai dit tantôt, on se heurte à certains problèmes actuellement. C'est parce que ces marchés financiers ne sont pas développés que la majorité de nos organismes n'arrive même pas à traduire, à transcrire ces investissements, à transcrire ces réserves, mettre ces réserves sur les marchés financiers. Nous, ce qu'on a constaté d'après les dernières études qu'on a menées, on voit que euh, 80 des réserves au maximum sont investies. Donc, il reste encore 20 qui ne sont pas remis sur le marché des capitaux et que les rendements, la, les classements des actifs vraiment utilisés par la majorité de nos organismes membres se focalise beaucoup plus sur les produits à court terme bancaires. Rarement, certains se sont quand même commencé à aller dans l'aspect immobilier, aller également sur tout ce qui est marché de, des actions, mais la concentration est telle que ces organismes encourent un risque vraiment élevé du fait que la majorité des réserves sont placées sur un, deux ou trois regroupements d'actifs. Donc, euh, pour la CIPRES, ce sera vraiment euh, une opportunité d'avoir tous euh, ces, ces autres vecteurs de placement, mais euh, nous avons quand même posé la question à l'équipe qui a mené cette étude de, qui, 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 qui nous interpelle actuellement également, c'est le fait que comment développer, comment euh, maintenant donc, implémenter tous ces systèmes, toutes ces, 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 ces offres, si je peux me le permettre, au sein des marchés financiers de certains États, les États que l'équipe a, okay, okay, a, 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 a inscrit dans, dans cette étude sont quand même des États qui connaissent un certain développement, mais euh, on sait qu'il reste beaucoup d'États africains qui ont des difficultés à faire euh, développer ces marchés financiers. Donc, euh, améliorer l'offre d'actifs, je pense qu'on peut avoir une réponse de la part des, des, de l'équipe qui a mené cette étude 
pour les moyens de déployer. Euh, par rapport aux autres recommandations, je pense que euh, la CIPRES est en phase avec les recommandations de l'équipe d'études, notamment surtout sur euh, l'aspect euh, clarté réglementaire, l'émission des, des différentes euh, directives et règles, on va peut-être en, en parler tout à l'heure, et surtout euh, l'aspect sensibilisation et euh, l'aspect diffusion et collecte des données. Voilà ce que je peux dire en préliminaire d'abord concernant les présentations. Je serai ravi et je suis disponible donc à apporter des éclaircissements, des réponses à d'autres questions tout à l'heure. Merci Guy. Merci M. Andrea Manalina. Effectivement, vous avez soulevé un point important qui est revenu très souvent au cours de nos échanges avec les, les caisses d'assurance et fonds de pension. C'est leur intérêt pour le secteur immobilier. Euh, malheureusement, il n'y a pas... Euh, sur, le, sur le marché d'instruments euh, attractifs et aussi qui, qui respectent euh, la réglementation en la matière. Um, let me now turn to uh, Mr. Oguche. Um, Mr. Oguche, Jacqueline, in her presentation, mentioned uh, a recent report. I think it's dated uh, 2021, uh, December 2021, so, um, in which uh, there was a clear um, desire uh, from the uh, pension fund to increase their allocation in uh, uh, private equities and uh, more impactful uh, investments. Um, but you also, you also mentioned a couple of bottlenecks. Uh, can you speak to, uh, to those and, uh, and tell us overall, how do you think um, those pension funds can increase their uh, contribution to, to the real economy. Yeah, I think Mr. Oguche is having trouble with his connection. He's, uh, he's offline now. Okay, okay. So thank you, Alain Stefan. So we're going to then uh, continue the discussion with, uh, with our panel. And uh, before we, we open the, uh, the discussion to the to the audience, ask a, a second question on, on um, the assets allocation. Um, the report points to the lack of ever stable assets um, for diversification. Um, Dr. Shem, how do you think um, pension fund can increase? This is pretty much the same question that I asked to, to Mr. Oguche. How do you think pension fund can increase their uh, participation to the to funding the real economy. And can you speak to ongoing reforms uh, to really enable effective uh, portfolio diversification? Thank you very much. I can speak to that question, yes. Yes, I think uh, until very recently, as I said about five or so years ago, I think the markets are provided for these other alternative investment asset classes, which pension funds are just getting familiar to invest in. I just want to give you a picture from Kenya of how this regulatory framework looks like. I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a total of uh, actually 15 different uh, investment asset classes. Just for the past year, that is between 2020 and 2021, more than actually 90% of pension funds accumulated assets under management. And now by 2021, we had, uh, we had uh, about $14.8 billion in terms of assets under management. Investment in government securities took nearly half of it at 45.69%. Quoted equities took 16.45%. Immovable property 16.4 and guaranteed funds 16.7. If you total that one up, it's in excess of 95%. So you can see what is remaining for alternative investments that were introduced recently. And we provided the caps for them. And let me just show you the capping that we did. So we introduced, for example, private equity and capped it at uh, 10%. We introduced the uh, exchange uh, traded derivatives and capped it at 5%. And, uh, and uh, also 
we have the last asset category, we call it any other asset. And that has been a very important market development for us because when the market is very innovative and they are defined products which we have not captured in our investment schedule, and we require that pension funds develop their investment policy statement with the guidance of that schedule, should they be so innovative and come up with an asset class that we've not thought about, they would write to the regulator and we engage. And if the risks are not too much, then we could allow them to experiment in the market with that and invest. And we have kept that at 10%. So I said that the actual investments in these are really low, but in terms of the experiences we've gotten from last year, investment in private equity rose by 18 point, around 5% and investment in raised increased by more than 100%, although the investments are really very minute. That is an indication that uh, I think pension funds are having an appetite for this. And as I observed earlier, the challenge that they have is lack of familiarity with these particular products. And so to ensure that uh, we grow their appetite to invest in alternative asset classes, I think we need to upscale their level of know-how on these alternative investments. And that calls for a lot of education, that calls for a lot of uh, holding their hands really and working with them together. And we encourage co-investments in this particular area because they really stand to gain a lot from those uh, experts that, that have invested in this environment for a long time outside the continent. And that can give them a really comfortable uh, feeling to continue to invest in this particular investment asset classes. In, in Kenya, for example, just a year or two ago, just because of what I said that uh, most of the scheme, the pension funds are small and they cannot afford individually to invest in large ticket projects. They came together and formed a consortium. So we encourage that kind of uh, development Although they still invest along the guidelines given in the investment schedule, and they are also required to develop an investment policy statement as a consortium, but they are able now to invest in those large ticket projects. And to just enable them to channel more resources to these alternative asset classes, and particularly to investments. And this speaks to the affordable housing component and infrastructure development. We engage with the uh, capital markets regulator, capital markets authority, and agreed to introduce a new asset class. We call it debt instruments for the financing of infrastructure and affordable housing. We haven't seen it, it attracting because it's still relatively new, but we have product, provided a cap for it at 10%. And we particularly wanted to create appetite for the consortium to channel some of their resources using this particular in instrument for the development of affordable houses and infrastructure in Kenya. And that can boost the allocations of pension funds investments to these other alternative investment asset classes. Thank you, Dr. Shem. I'm glad that you that you also mentioned the uh, uh, the need to increase the, the know-how uh, because that was also one major recommendation from, from the report, uh, the capacity building efforts uh, that needs to be uh, to be undertaken. Thank you for pointing this out. Uh, I'm going to ask the, the same question to Mr. Andre Manalina and also um, ask about this um, this need to increase capacity because during our conversation with the uh, with the pension fund and uh, and retirement uh, institutions, uh, they show clear they show clear interest for private equity, venture capital assets for even infrastructure assets, but they didn't know how to, to invest, how to assess the risk reward um, and do the, the due diligence. So um, the recommendation here is for DFIs or other large institutions to come as co-investors with those firms. So what, what is your, uh, your take on, on the subject? Oui, euh, merci Guy. Effectivement, l'intervention des institutions de sécurité sociale, notamment les caisses de retraite, dans les nouveaux vecteurs de placement n'est ne, pas irréalisable. Hein. Cependant, il faut à mon avis que 
on, on a d'abord un système de cadrage de ces interventions-là. Et moi, en tant que représentant d'un régulateur de, de système de sécurité sociale, je voudrais partager un peu ici les actions que nous avons menées depuis et qui sont en train d'être implémentées actuellement. C'est que on avait d'abord renforcé les cadres présidentiels au sein des organismes membres de la CIPRES. Comment C'est parce qu'en fixant des principes de gouvernance, parce qu'on sait que les prises de décision, la fixation des politiques et l'arrêtage des stratégies de placement devraient remonter au niveau de la gouvernance. Et ce qu'on a confirmé dans notre directive auprès des organismes membres de la CIPRES, c'est la responsabilité du conseil d'administration dans la gestion des réserves, notamment la création d'un comité d'investissement au sein conseil de, du conseil d'administration, l'obligation d'adopter une politique de placement et à travers l'obligation de procéder à des évaluations actu actuarielles pour permettre et pour avoir une visibilité sur la formulation des stratégies. Ça, c'est d'une part. D'autre part, on a émis également un cadre juridique, un règlement portant norme, normalisation prudentielle de tous les placements dans les organismes de, 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 de membres de la CIPRES. Donc, on les a fixés un seuil minimum d'investissement des réserves. Donc, dorénavant, 90 des réserves doivent être investies. Ça, c'est déjà quelque chose, parce qu'on sait qu'il y a quand même un certain seuil, je l'ai expliqué tout à l'heure, que les réserves augmentent d'année en année ces, dernières, ces cinq dernières années. On les oblige, je l'ai dit tantôt, à avoir une politique claire de placement, suivant donc les engagements de régime, lier la gestion des actifs avec la gestion des engagements de leur régime. Et surtout, avoir des limitations en général. Donc, limitation minimum, bien sûr, sur certaines classes d'actifs, mais une limitation supérieure également. Donc, voilà, j'absurde la partie à ce cadrage prudentiel. Mais il y a un aspect que le docteur Chem a aussi soulevé tout à l'heure, que je voudrais un peu renforcer dans, cette, dans mon intervention, c'est le fait qu'il faut d'abord que ces offres soient connues par nos organismes de sécurité sociale. Donc moi, je demande actuellement à ce qu'il y aurait des communications euh, sur les acteurs de marché financier avec les organismes de prévoyance sociale et les, les, les régulateurs des, des marchés financiers avec les régulateurs des sécurités sociales. Voilà, à mon avis, un moyen qui va nous permettre vraiment d'aller vers ces... On sait que les besoins, l'équipe d'études a démontré tout à l'heure qu'il y a des besoins en capitaux. Et on, ils ont montré sur les pays qu'ils ont mené leurs études qu'il y a des capitaux disponibles. Mais comment les mobiliser Et nous, ce qu'on fait actuellement, c'est qu'on organise régulièrement des échanges. Des échanges entre organismes de sécurité sociale, mais des échanges avec des acteurs de marché financier régional. Et on organise pendant des forums internationaux, des forums internationaux sur la retraite. On a avec des rencontres réguliers, des échanges réguliers avec la CREM PMF, qui est un peu l'institution en charge de, de, de marché financier pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest. La COSUMAF, qui est aussi... La, le régulateur euh, du marché financier pour l'Afrique centrale. Et on essaie de traiter les opportunités de placement pour que les organismes de sécurité sociale disposent d'informations sur d'autres vecteurs que les vecteurs standards qu'ils ont, eux, dans leur pays. Ça, c'est la deuxième partie. Et la troisième partie des actions, à mon avis, c'est le fait que inciter maintenant les décideurs politiques qui a été euh, bien stipulé dans le, la, la recommandation de l'équipe d'études tout à l'heure, c'est parce qu'il faut qu'on arrive à sortir les capitaux d'une seule nation. On sait que, on a vu tout à l'heure qu'il y a certains marchés au sein du continent africain maintenant qui ont connu un bon, un bon développement. Il faut que les politiques, que les gouvernements autorisent les organismes de sécurité sociale à aller vers d'autres marchés à l'intérieur du continent africain et les faire fructifier et participer donc à la disponibilité de, de, de financement toujours au sein du continent. Moi, je pense que c'est un un, un, les trois points qui me semblent très importants actuellement pour qu'on puisse vraiment arriver à une bonne diversification et surtout atteindre les nouveaux classes d'actifs qui nous ont été présentés tout à l'heure. Merci, M. André Manalina. Euh, 
Juste une information pour notre, nos participants. Le rapport sera disponible juste après la session et donc vous aurez accès à partir d'un lien à la publication. Je vais maintenant me tourner vers David et puis et lui demander donc de nous rejoindre. Et ensemble, nous allons donc euh, traiter les, les questions de l'audience. Euh, Jacqueline aussi pourra nous, nous rejoindre pour euh, cette discussion. Nous recevons euh, beaucoup de questions et donc sa, sa contribution pourra être euh, utile. Euh, je vais donc euh, vous inciter à, à continuer de, de poster vos, vos questions. David. Yes. Um, hi, Guy. Um, thank you for that. I think... I've been I've been going through the questions and um, there were a couple that I wanted to um, address. I think the first one was about uh, it was it was more of a comment um, that said we didn't um, consider digital assets. Um, and I think um, the answer to that is we did not we really didn't set out to consider that complete the whole universe of um, investable assets. Um, what we were um, actually focused on were um, assets that were kind of linked to our priorities as, 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 um, as DFIs, but also looking at assets where people, the pension funds were actually investing. I don't think we came across any digital um, assets at all. Um, in our in our in our in our research, so um, that was that's a, a response to that comment. Then there was also a question about whether this was a question from from Cecile about whether we had actually um, considered sort of how fit for purpose the regulation was um, in terms of of protecting investors. In terms of investor protection, um, which I presume um, refers to the the, um, the the contributors to these um, pension funds, etc., and I think the answer to that is we we did and we did not, in the sense that um, that was not the main focus of of the research. I think one of the things that we set out to explore or to show. Um, through this research was we often hear that the regulation in Africa does not allow um, pension funds to invest in certain asset classes. But I think we wanted to show that the regulation does allow investment in these asset classes and that there are other um, um, blockages. In terms of whether the regulation, I think, you know, regulation is a function of market development. And I think Shem kind of referred to that in his comments when he spoke about um, the need for capacity building for the for the pension funds. But I think also importantly, it's not just um, the fund managers or the um, the fund, you know, it's not just the fund, the asset owners or the fund managers. Um, it's also for the whole sort of ecosystem, including the regulators, so that everybody understands you know the the various risks um, around different assets and what is you know what is an adequate um, um, level of protection. Um, I've given two very long answers to very two very short questions, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I'll stop there and give others a chance to to jump in. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Jacqueline, feel free to to comment. I think we have a, a question from uh, Annette Molira about um, cross-border investment. Um, Annette says that uh, some regulations hinder investing outside the region, but may ironically allow investing in international markets. Uh, do you have any specific comments on, uh, on Annette's point? Uh, Yes, I, su I suppose we, we, we did hear that, um, particularly for certain asset classes, I, I think this came up in our discussions on private equity venture capital, um, 
that the, the limited availability of, of, of local uh, product was, was a big impediment, certainly a bigger impediment, as David mentioned, than any of the regulatory thresholds um, that, that, that pension funds and market pension funds and asset managers faced. Um, so, so one of the findings that, that we had that relates to your question, Guy, is that access to foreign domiciled asset classes, especially intra-regionally, um, through an experienced international PE fund manager, uh, according to the market stakeholders with whom we conferred, may provide some diversification opportunities where permit, permitted. So, so there are still some constraints on the ability to take up uh, foreign domiciled asset classes. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the, 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 this, this is more so an issue, I believe, in um, Ghana, Ni Ni Nigeria, um, and to some extent, Kenya. Though, of course, in Kenya, within the East Africa community, um, the the uh, cross-border investment there by pension funds and local institutional investors is, is, is considered um, domestic for, for the purposes of, of, of regulation on any thresholds. And of course, Dr. Shem could speak better to that than I can. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, Dr. Shem, do you want to add to Jacqueline's contribution? Yes, uh, I can add just a little. Yes, I think she's right. In the in our investment schedule, we treat the East African community as a domestic market. So pension funds invested in Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and now DRC are treated as local investments, and that that gives us a very comfortable wide investment uh, domestic investment uh, market. But I think even across the continent, I think pension funds can still exist. The only challenge is the way uh, the, re the, the regulatory frameworks actually treat the taxation of pension funds. So we have got different uh, taxation regimes across different countries in the continent, which are not similar, and that can be an impediment. Some have got exempt, exempt tax, that means exempt contributions exempt the income that is generated, so it's not tax, but tax when it is at the payout phase. Others have exempt tax exempt, so that will call for a lot of negotiations amongst investors across the continent in order to probably have bilateral agreements in terms of uh, tax treatment. I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen another question, maybe I can just comment about it slightly, but I think yes, absolutely. We, want the, we would want to hear also the responses from the researchers who have come up with the publication, Mr. Nzomo Mutuku, who is, uh, who is uh, our CEO here until the end of June, is asking a question there, to what extent are the pension funds taking into account ESG factors as they go into the, the new asset classes? Yes, I think, I think locally, yes, not yet very much, but we have indications that uh, especially members, the contributors of the funds, the members of the various pension schemes, actually really are interested in making profit, but not at the expense of, uh, of uh, a devastation to the environment, their social fabric and the governance. And so they really are looking for investments that are sustainable in that regard into the future. I think it's a new phenomenon, it's just a wake up call that came to us nearly about two years ago when we had our first inaugural Africa Pension Supervisors Forum conference held here in Nairobi, and evidence was adduced to that regard. And so regulators, I think, are waking up to this, and we are going to pay a lot of attention in the future that uh, our investments or where pension funds are invested should actually be ESG compliant. But I believe the other, the other speakers can actually maybe also respond to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shem. I think, David, you, you want to say something on the subject. I saw your hand raised. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I'd raised my hand, um, not on the ESG point. I think my point had been covered, and I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember what it was, and I, and I can't. 
Um, sorry, it's gone. No, yeah, that's fine, David. That's fine. We have we have uh, several other questions, and uh, um, Moana uh, uh, raised her hand, but uh, we're waiting for her to to join the the, the conversation. In the meantime, uh, Risha Fusi. Oh, she's here. Okay, let me unmute her. Okay, Noana, you can unmute your microphone and ask the question live. Noana, are you there? You on mute. Okay, we're going to um, to continue with the with the list of questions. We have a question from Richard Fusi. Richard is asking the the key the key uh, issues impeding uh, participation of regional and international pension fund in investment in Africa. Uh, and also, we ask another question, which is a, a key question. Also, we want also to ask our our panel on the DFI's contribution uh, to unlock more investment and resources uh, from international and regional pension funds. Anyone want to take on this question? Uh, maybe I can. Maybe I can take a stab at that. Try to sure, try to make up. <laughs> um, I I I think that's. Um, first of all, thank you, Richard. I, and I think, um, that is really the question that we set out to answer, right? Um, that is that is really the question that we set out to answer with this with this research. Um. And I think what this report does is it gives us part of the answer, but it doesn't give us all the answers um, that, that um, there is to need. I think to summarize um, at a high level, what we are learning is that there is actually appetite, be it for infrastructure, be it for private equity, um, be it for investments in the, in the green space, um, you know, and all the all the things that um, all the areas where Africa needs more investment and more domestic investment. So I think the appetite is there. I think what is happening, or what has been happening, is that there is a lack of product. Now, when I say a lack of product, I mean a lack of product that is adapted to our domestic pension funds. There's a lack of product that is um, adapted to the pension fund, the African pension fund that is managing perhaps $2 billion as opposed to the pension fund that is managing $100 billion. They're completely different. There is a lack of product for the African pension fund that is looking to make its first investment in infrastructure. Right, so it's a lack of product from um, from various points of view, from a capacity point of view, in terms of the capacity of the African investors, which we've discussed, a lack of um, um, a lack of product from a regulatory point of view. Other structures that we propose, we are is that you know product product developers are proposing to our institutional investors. Do they take into account the local? Um, regulations, or are they based on something that is done in the global north with the assumption that these will apply um, 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 to Africa? So there's, you know, there's, 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 there's all that. And I think also the solution um, has been talked about. There isn't a one size fits all solution. I think that all stakeholders, be it the project developers, the domestic investors, the investors from the global north, if they're interested in co-investing, um, the regulators, the DFIs, need to get around the table and work on specific live examples to develop structures that work. And guess what? The thing is that, you know, what works in Kenya will not necessarily work in Nigeria, will not necessarily work in Umoa because um, the context is different and for very different and, and valid reasons. So um, for me, it's, it's, it really is about that. It really is saying, you know, in each market or whatever, let's take one project 
that we want to do. And let's all get around the table and see how we can use our various instruments from everybody, from the DFIs, from the domestic pension funds, what the regulator needs to do, what the policymakers need to do um, to find a solution. I don't know if that makes sense. Hello. Hello, Keith. Can you hear me? Yes, David. So I see we have one question, one hand, hand raised in the audience. So I'm going to allow the person to uh, ask a question live. OK, go ahead. Hi, um, David, thanks very much. Uh, this is Richard. Thanks for your responses to, to those. There was a third question um, that was uh, related to uh, that, but I think that um, maybe David, um, sorry, um, my colleague missed that one. The third one is uh, to a specific sector because we, we, we've we worked with other, uh, I think what you referred to was the Global North, we've worked with uh, other investors from that, from that region. And we have realized that farmland as an asset class has been proven to be a great alternative for portfolio diversification. And we believe that this is an asset class that has uh, characteristics that are well aligned with the asset liability management requirements of uh, pension funds. And of course, some, some sovereign wealth funds as well, because um, the, the time horizon uh, kind of mimics the, the perpetuity characteristics of their uh, asset liability management profile. However, this asset class in Africa is not attracting as much investment uh, from pension funds as it should. So I was just wondering whether in the context of what you've done, um, were you able to uh, sound you know, the appetite? And this relates to the first question that I mentioned, which was on what you saw or you found out as emerging asset classes in Africa uh, that are attracting most attention. But then in the specific case of farmland, what could be the reason uh, for this low uh, appetite from uh, pension funds in spite of the aligned characteristics of this asset class? And what can do you think we can do, especially in the DFI context, to unlock uh, pension funds appetite in this asset class? Uh, considering that Africa holds about, uh, you know, 50 to 60% of the uh, arable or, or high quality farmland in the world. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, yeah. thanks, Richard. Um, I mean, we, we didn't, we didn't specifically look at farmland. As I say, we didn't look at um, the total universe of, 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 of assets. And, and to be honest, um, it, it, as you say, it, it, this, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to you, um, it, 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 didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't even, it didn't even come up. I mean, my, my gut instinct is the reason that is is because of you know the land tenure issues the 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 security of title etc cetera, etc cetera, issues that we have we have across um africa and so i think with specific reference to the farmland that would be the issue but generally i would say that with all the asset classes um we found that Actually, we found that the um, African institutional investors are being perfectly rational. Okay, they're being they're being perfectly rational and they're behaving as you would want an investor to behave. So take infrastructure, um, um, for example, and I always I always use this example, and it's from it's from Nigeria, uh, where people were saying to us, "Well, look, you know." It's not that we don't want to do infrastructure, but people are coming to us saying put equity in one infrastructure um, asset. It may be a road, it may be a power station, it may be whatever. I'm a small pension fund. First of all, um, I think, uh, you know, as I say, a lot of the pension funds in Africa are managing um, assets in the single billions, not even in the tens, never mind the hundreds. So. First of all, we all know that if you're going to do, if you're going to make 
sort of money in, in investments. You have, to, you have to diversify. So if you want to get the benefits of having infrastructure in your portfolio, just putting all your money in one infrastructure, all your um, infrastructure allocation in one infrastructure asset is not going to do it for you. Um, it's a concentration of risk. There, there are all sorts of issues. So I think um, we, we tend to forget that there are a lot of second order, second order um, um, issues that we don't see um, um, necessarily, um, but, that, but that these guys see and so um, they're behaving rationally. And that's why I say, or we say, we are saying, it really is about sitting down and saying, you know, how can we make this work? So coming back to the Nigeria example. So in Nigeria, they have, an, they have the pension funds have an allocation to infrastructure equity, which they can do through funds, right? I think that is kind of like, I think it's about 5% of AUM if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. They also have an allocation to infrastructure bonds, um, which they can do. The allocation to infrastructure bonds is, I think, 20, 15, 20%. So it's three to four times as much as they can do in equity. But they're saying people come to us and they want to talk infrastructure, but they want us to do equity. And we say, no, actually, we can't do equity because you know, it's a new, it's a new area for us. We want to start, let's start with um, infrastructure debt. Let's do some infrastructure bonds. And they're like, no, the infrastructure bond, the infrastructure debt has been sold to um, investors X, Y, and Z, and all we need for you is from you is equity. So that's the point I'm making about a lack of product being adapted to what the markets need or what the investors are, are looking for. And I think what is actually happening is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of product pushing as opposed to providing investment solutions for our domestic um, institutional investors. I don't know if that makes sense. It does, David. Thanks very much for all your responses. Sincerely appreciate it. No worries, thank you. Um, I'm seeing, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going down the chat. Um, there's a question on, do you think that these alternative products may cause a crowding out effect from treasury bonds um, to private instruments, which could make the deficits financing more complicated? Um, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very hot question. Um, I, 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 I think so, and I, and I think um, if they did, then that would just be the market's working. And actually, I think one of, the, one of the key issues, one of the key impediments in terms of, you know, pension funds diversifying across some of the markets was that we saw that um, government bonds, government, government rates in some markets were so high that there was actually no point considering anything else because the risk-free rate was, was so high. So, if anything, um, right now across most of the markets that we looked at, we are seeing the opposite. And I think this is one of the issues, this speaks to one of the issues around um, macroeconomic stability. Um, that also comes out clearly in the report. Uh, consideration of ESG factors, we've dealt with those. As a question that says, how can we best empower African institutional investors to apply DD that the global North then wants to participate alongside without having to divert to DFIs or other multilaterals? This is, this is from a Chris McLean, and I'm not sure, um, Chris, whether, I'm not sure whether you're saying we should have to attract investors from the global north instead of DFIs, but Jackie, do you want to try that one? Hi, yeah, I, I think we, we focused the study 
specifically on local institutional investors. So um, I, I mean, there there is a role for there, there is a role for foreign institutional investors, of course, um, here. Uh, and and, and I, I think there are a number of initiatives that that were already acknowledged that. Um, but but we we did place the emphasis on, on the asset classes of interest to local institutional investors because um, from a macroeconomic standpoint, the development development of a local institutional investor base, a strong local institutional investor base, that would be able to take up assets and um, provide a buffer in the event of uh, private capital flow reversals um, as external financial conditions change, which we are seeing now is so important. So that's why we have this emphasis on local institutional investors. Thank you, Jackie. If there's another, um, there's another question from Chris. Where do carbon credits factor into the view that African institutions want to participate in? Um, is it led by others or, or a value add? I think, um, again, we didn't, we didn't um, really look at carbon credits. They just, um, because what we did was we started off with a, rather with a list of um, sort of alternative asset types that we were interested in and confirmed that um, with it within the focus markets. Again, um, carbon credits didn't come up, but I think that generally with, with everything, um, and, and Jackie, Jackie will, 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 will confirm this, um, with everyone that we spoke to, what we were hearing was, you know, whether it be carbon credits or infrastructure or, or, or housing or private equity, we are here really to maximize our returns. So um, let's look at the returns and then we can have a conversation about, let's look at, the, let's have a conversation around the potential returns first, and then we can talk about how we invest in it or how or if we do. Jackie, anything to add on that? Thanks, David. The only thing I might add, and, and it's really just recapping uh, a point from, from the presenta presentation, is that one of the key findings we found is that in terms of green and other thematic assets, a key point, the starting point from the perspective of investors, and as you already said, makes, makes ent entire sense, given that they're managing portfolios and must generate adequate returns that reflect fair pricing, um, is, is, is that the asset class, no matter what it is, whether it's green or, or any other kind of um, <clears throat> uh, niche asset class, would have to generate returns. Um, to some extent, we, we, we did hear that a few asset managers in Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria in particular indicated to us they would be willing to trade off some returns for sustainability or at least weight them equally important in importance. But as David already said, from the perspective of uh, an institutional investor, especially a pension fund that, that has to um, generate, ma ma maximize returns, do, do that balance of maximizing returns and um, safeguarding contractual savings, um, there, there must be, there, there must be a reasonable return involved. Thank you, Jackie. I see we are a bit over our 90 minutes slot. So there's just um, one last question from Cecile. Uh, Cecile Lambert that I'm, I'm going to take and it really is around I, and I'm gonna I'd like to take it because I think it's a it's a it's an important one. Um, it's really around um, forex risk and the question is um, I'd be interested in hearing some views about the potential arbitrage and risks that would come from investing in FX denominated assets relative to local currency liabilities for most um, African institutional investors. Um, beyond capital slash reserves preser preservation, how do African institutions 
institutional investors approach investing externally as part of their ALM approach for FX risk? Um, I think the answer to that, um, Cecile, is that actually um, in the main, um, African institutional investors are restricted to investing in their domestically, right? There are a few exceptions like um, Kenya, where they're allowed to invest in the region and the Southern African funds um, are allowed to invest um, externally. So they do a lot of a lot of offshore on the international markets and, and stuff. Um, but otherwise it's 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 almost limited to non-existent in most countries. The issue where where FX uh, where FX risk does play a role, for example, is in is in private equity. And again, I'll use the example of, of Nigeria, where it was actually um, it's actually become a barrier to them investing in 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 private equity, or you know dollar denominated assets, because what they're saying is, you know, my my books are in naira, right, or in my local currency, whatever that currency may be. If I invest in a private equity fund today, and I put say I don't know, a um, million dollars for the for, 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 for argument's sake. Today that is booked in my books at a Naira value equivalent today or local currency value equivalent today. If there is a depreciation, then that goes up, you know, not only over um, as, as time goes on, but, you know, when it comes down to the drawdown, basically, um, because I don't know where the currency is going to go, it's it's kind of a bit like writing an open-ended check. So, in that sense, um, it it it's the forex issue actually becomes a barrier to them investing in some of the dollar-denominated assets. I don't know if I if that makes sense. But I think the main point is there isn't much. Um, external invest invest investing going on so um i think with that we've dealt with most of the questions and i'm also very conscious that we are running we are running over time so let me now invite dr isa fai who is the director of ifc sector economics department to give us his closing remarks thank you very much Hi, David. Uh, and unfortunately, Isa had another commitment at this time. I guess we've gone a bit old over. Oh dear. So oh, sorry. Exactly drop off. Um, I, I I could recap those if you like. Or perhaps. yes, please do, Jackie. Okay. Um, we we would first of all very much certainly from IFC like to thank making finance work for Africa, all of the colleagues involved in, 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 in the intense push in these last several days to, to launch this report and, and this webinar. Um, Ellen Stefan Moulot, Tony May King, who led on the communication side, did such a wonderful job in, in getting our, our, our participation on this webinar. Clément Coffey, who worked so dil diligently over the weekend on, on report layout and design. Catherine Garson on, on, on the editing of the report. And of course, um, my partners on this, David Ashkibor and, and Guy Menon. Um, so, so thank you so much to, to everyone um, involved in, in getting this report uh, published and co-launched today. We had a full program which brought in rich perspectives, including as most relevant from local market stakeholders, actively leading the policy and practitioner initiative central to this agenda within African markets. Um, we, we'd also like to extend sincere thanks to panelists, Marco Andri Mandalina, Head of Support Advisory and Assistance Unit for Social Security Institutions at Cyprus, and Dr. Alfred Umashem, the Chief Manager and Head Research and Strategy Department of the Retirement Benefits Authority in Kenya. 
Um, many thanks to all webinar participants for your attention and time today. I know we have run over and to those sharing questions and comments. Um, so why do we within the World Bank Group take an interest in making these closing remarks in developing local institutional investors in African markets and their interest <clears throat> in non-traditional asset classes? Of course, the impact of the COVID crisis and subsequent shocks have raised the profile of a broader policy discussion within African and other developing countries on determining the best means of tapping into pools of domestic capital, particularly longer term capital where these exist. Going forward, responses emerging from this discussion will be important to ensuring a more sustainable economic recovery and responding to future shocks. Local institutional investors with longer term investment horizons such as pension funds underpin the buy side of local capital markets. And when these local investors diversify their portfolios into instruments and vehicles that channel capital toward longer term uses, such as building and maintaining vital infrastructure, mitigating climate change and providing more affordable housing, they may not only gain an enhanced means of managing risk, including during economic downturns. These investments can provide new ways to mobilize domestic capital to help meet priority longer term socioeconomic development needs and a well-developed base of local institutional investors with longer term investment horizons may play a role in bolstering an economy's resilience to sudden, sudden destabilizing uh, capital flow reversals. So as we have been discussing today, our report gauging appetite of African institutional investors for new asset classes, we hope presents timely findings from uh, the study that we carried out jointly, um, IFC, African Development Bank, and Making Finance Work for Africa in Partnership. Our joint findings identify potential areas for local market interventions and supporting national reforms to help further develop local institutional investors along, as longer term asset managers. We encourage you to, to go through and read the report, which of course will provide more detail by country market and asset class than we could provide here in the limited time. Um, and we thank you so much for your participation and uh, time today as we have gone 15 minutes over. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jackie, for that. And in closing, I think it would be wrong for me uh, to close this without um, giving Jackie a special mention because she's the one who has actually done a lot of the heavy lifting and the writing on the report, a lot of um, the verification of, of the data and all that. So Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, we couldn't have done this without your support. And to our participants, thank you again for joining us. Sorry about um, running over time. You will receive a link to the presentation, um, hopefully today, I think. Um, and then the webinar presentation and the recordings will come out to you within 24 hours. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, David.